This makes no sense to me. It sounds like people banging spoons together. What was that though? <laughs> His cloak was clipping. Yeah, it did, yeah. Oh, oh. Do you know what I mean? It's all, it's that movement. Gorgeous. Yeah. Total S tier. Flashback! It's August 2021. Warhammer Plus just released. You signed up for the free models and cool exclusive Warhammer animations and then had to wait a year for your free model and realised there were only a handful of shows with only a couple of episodes each. A bit of a rocky start, but that was more than two years ago. I think it's about time we had a look at the matured Warhammer Plus to see what it has to offer. Rank each and every show on the platform, give the service a thorough review, and finally decide if it's worth the price tag. And also, for some extra spice, the OG Warhammer Plus Masterclass videographer and director now works for Midwinter Minis. My name's Guy. And I'm Hattie, former Games Workshop videographer, and you're watching Midwinter Minis. And just in case you were thinking, hey, you're a big Warhammer themed channel, you probably get paid by Games Workshop, how can we trust you? Well friend, I applaud your scepticism, but nope, we are entirely funded by our awesome team of supporters on Patreon, the YouTube ads you probably blocked, and the occasional awesome sponsor like Incogni for this video, but we'll talk about that later. Also, back when Warhammer Plus launched, I made a video reviewing it, giving my honest opinion on the shows, and Games Workshop abused YouTube's copyright flagging system and demonetized my video on the days it had its most views. So I ended up making almost no money from that video at all. So let's just say there's no love lost there. I do, on the other hand, bloody love Warhammer though. I love its themes, I love its setting, I love its content, I love its community. So hopefully we should be able to give a pretty balanced view on the whole thing. Now I'm going to be honest here, I haven't watched anything on Warhammer Plus or Warhammer TV since my original review more than two years ago. And I haven't watched anything since I quit due to stress. So we'll be taking a look with pretty fresh eyes. I'm a bit nervous to see what they did with my Masterclass show, to be honest, since all of the OG staff left. Right then, ranking every Warhammer TV show, let's go! <laughs> Interrogator is a violent, noir-style animation following the world-weary, drunken, drug-addled anti-hero and inquisitor interrogator named Jürgen on his quest for revenge in the slum hive of Geisthaven. Ooh, it's war anime. <laughs> I really like the grim, dark animation style, obviously that's what they're going for. It looks great, I think. There's already tons and tons of violence, like really quite graphic violence, and also there's like child murder in the first minute of the first episode. There's also plenty of swearing, like some pretty serious full-on swearing. It seems like they think they have a really great and interesting plot, but I'd love to know what it is. It is quite slow and twisted and obtuse, and the way the episodes are laid out, everything leads up to these kind of weird climactic cliffhangers, but you don't really ever know what's going on. This main character seems to only speak in very dramatic riddles. Yeah, there's lots of like conjecture and what's the word? Very annoying. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, the title sequence is pretty cool. I like the title sequence. It's very dramatic. It really falls victim to that whole trope of all of the guards and bodyguards and all of the enemies being incredibly bad marksmen and incredibly slow to react, which just kind of makes any danger that any of the main characters are in not seem like it's dangerous at all. I'm also finding it pretty inaccessible. As someone who doesn't know that much about Warhammer, the deep lore, the characters, all the different factions, this makes no sense to me. Yeah. I really like the black and white palette, but it kind of does let itself down slightly sometimes because a lot of these stories are told through flashbacks and through visions. In other media you might be able to have different visual effects happening but when it's just black and white you can just have kind of like black and white with a little bit of kind of swirl or something rather than having fun with the colours to make it obvious which makes the non-linear storytelling a little bit confusing sometimes. Oh I'm so sick of that evil guy and his coin. <laughs> <laughs> there are some characters in this that have pretty cool voices but a lot of them, they're just hamming it up, something rotten. We've been through every episode, we've watched everything really, really thoroughly, and I do not care about any of these characters. I have no attachment to anyone. I just don't care. I ca I'm really struggling here. <laughs> the title sequence is so long. These episodes are so short, and they're wasting, like, 
a quarter of them were just titles, despite the fact that none of the staff get credits. Yeah, each episode is about 10, 12 minutes long. Annoyingly, now we've finished every single one, the last thing on the list is the final cut where you can watch the whole thing as a kind of short film, which would have made way more sense and we should have done that. But I still think the pace of the storytelling would have really suffered because you've got that kind of crescendo of cliffhanger every 10 minutes or so, which is a really tiring way of watching something. I wish they'd stop with these stupid quotes. They don't mean anything. <laughs> They're not quotes from anything. <laughs> the music is okay. I don't really feel like it adds much. The visuals are very stylized, but the music's quite generic. It doesn't really fit, in my opinion. There's lots of examples in this of quite stereotypically weak storytelling in that you are told certain things about characters and about how they are and about what they have done, rather than being shown Every single episode starts with a like 30 second or one minute long soliloquy by the main character of just absolute garbled gibberish riddles. When we started watching this, I was really, really hoping for the best. It kind of looked like Grim Dark Archer, and I was all for that. But I've just been left really disappointed, unfortunately. It had so much promise, in my opinion, but uh, it didn't really deliver. So I'm going to give this a D. E minus. I hate this show. <laughs> Nothing happens. Not interested. Don't like it. E. Next! <laughs> the Exodite is a short 3D animated series that sees a small, stealthy Tau strike force infiltrate a war-torn world to find a mysterious target with hopes of ending the conflict. I mean, this is very pretty. It looks really, really nice. Kind of reminds me of the cinematics you get in AAA video games, you know? That kind of really, really high quality, very polished, beautiful visuals. It looks great. It's definitely very pretty. Yeah, the lip syncing is a little bit strange. <laughs> I really like the music actually. It's got real kind of Ghost in the Shell vibes to it. I think it suits this animation really, really nicely. It's very scene setting, nice. The voices are a little bit strange. There doesn't seem to be a discernible Tau accent. They all seem to have slightly different accents and the main character is just generic American woman. So it's a little bit jarring. Again though, what's the plot? We're at the end of episode one and I don't know what's going on. <laughs> it's war. It's war. That's it. Yes, it's war. There's a lot of assumptions going on here, which maybe makes it a bit inaccessible for new viewers. It absolutely does, I can tell you that. I mean, at least there's some good visual storytelling here and that it shows you things rather than telling you things. It shows you that the Tau are really good at shooting and it shows you that they're actually not very good at fighting in close combat. Just a quick nerdy aside, from a sound engineer's perspective, it's really nice that when the Tau are inside their battle suits, there's absolutely no echo on their voices. It sounds really tight and anechoic and claustrophobic. And when they're out Outside, it sounds all vibrant and kind of realistic. So that's a really nice touch. Well done, sound engineers. Oh, what was that though? <laughs> Look, no, go back. It looked like his cloak was clipping. Yeah, it did, yeah. Through his armor. Yeah. That seems like a thing that would have been easily caught by the animator themselves, and maybe they just weren't given enough time to actually yeah. fix it and send it back. It's the kind of thing you just see in video games, which maybe isn't what you expect to see when you're actually putting out a really high quality, possibly high budget animation. Hmm. <laughs> oh no, what is that Eldar's face? Oh, no. ah, the voice acting and facial animations just really don't go together there. That is horribly jarring. Okay, seeing Warlord Titans be massive and badass and absolutely destroying everything is awesome. And also seeing a Eldar Phantom Titan and a Warlord go head to head, I'm not gonna lie, that's cool. Episode 1 looked really, really polished. Episode 2 and 3 look a little bit more rushed. There's loads of little random discrepancies with the animation and random backgrounds disappearing and fabric clipping through people's bodies. It looks a bit strange. It kind of feels like an extended trailer rather than an actual release. Mm. Just not enough happens. Some Tau die, they have a little fight with some people, they have some chats and they confront an Eldar Ranger. There's a bit of a standoff and then it gets a bit weird. There you go, that's the story in 20 seconds. You're welcome. I mean, I had initial high hopes seeing how beautiful it looked, but man, that was just rubbish. I would never watch that again and I wouldn't recommend anyone watch it. F, <laughs> for me, not interested. Hattie? Yeah, no, me too. It looks amazing. I'm sure the people that worked on it are incredibly talented, but man, you've only got the source material to work with, right? It was just a boring mm. story. I'm sorry, there's nothing interesting about it. The music was good. I want to stress that. The music was really good. I like that. By Legio Symphonica. Well done. 
Okay, next up is Angels of Death. In the unforgiving darkness of the far future, battles extend beyond the war-torn realms. In the sprawling datascape, your personal information is a relic coveted by unseen forces. Data brokers, like insidious heretics, hoard and peddle the sacred scrolls of your existence, seeking only to profit from the whispers of your digital footprint. But fear not, battle brothers and sisters. Enter Incogni, the unseen blade that cuts your ties with the foul data brokers of this world. Incogni is a simple yet highly effective cyber ritual that purges your records from the clutches of the data brokers, ensuring your information is respected as a sacred relic, concealed and protected. With deletion rights as thorough as our purging of Xenos filth, Incogni ensures your data vanishes like shadows in the warp. No more shall you be plagued by unsolicited transmissions. Your privacy, like our honor, remains unbroken. By following the link beneath this transmission and entering the sacred code Midwinter Minis, at checkout, you shall receive a 60% discount on an annual Incogni plan. Arise, battle brothers and sisters! Erase the footprints of your existence from the data scrolls. Achieve the anonymity you deserve in this vast galaxy. Incogni, like the Emperor, protects. Angels of Death is essentially a feature-length 3D animated film split into 10 episodes, following the crew of the Blood Angels Sword of Baal strike cruiser suffering not the alien to live. There are some extra origins stories, which are little extra videos, but the main event is about 2 hours 45 minutes, cut into little episodes, but you can watch it as one big thing, like a film, so that's what we're going to do. And it looks really nice, it's very, very stylized, all black and white, but with red things being red, really vibrant red. It's very video game cutscene again. I mean, good video game cutscene, to be fair. It looks, oh, yeah. it looks really, really, really nice. I don't think anyone wants Warhammer Pixar, to be fair. Oh, check out Brother James Blunt over here. <laughs> We're running into a familiar thing here. The voice acting is pretty good. Uh, the lip syncing is really not good. <laughs> Feels a bit strange. Fortunately, so far, most of the people talking have got helmets on. You know, it's a bit more forgiving. Oh, there's some more quotes. You do love your quotes. I hate them so much. <laughs> It's annoying. I recognise some of these voice actors, but I just can't place them. It's again, it's a real shame that none of these actors are credited. Boggles the mind. The music is okay. It's pretty generic-y sci-fi background music. It feels like it's not a score in the sense that a composer has made it specifically for this. It feels like just music that's been made that's been ported in to drop wherever it feels appropriate, which, you know, is a cheaper way of doing things. Okay, we've been watching this for a while now, and it's really starting to bother me that there's shaky cam in almost every single shot. Mm -hmm. Shots that don't need it, yeah. and even the shots that would potentially benefit from it, it's so overdone, mm. it's making me feel sick. Yeah, it's really like quite nauseating sometimes. It's a bit weird. Honestly, I can't look directly at it. Yeah, like in the middle of really dense, massive action scenes, cool, go for it. But you know, if people are just standing around talking while stuff is happening around them, stop shaking the camera, it's really horrible. It's like someone's holding me while I'm watching it and just jiggling my body around. To give it its credit, the action sequences are great. It's a pretty decent story and you can actually follow along with what's going on. It's quite easy to follow. It's, I would say it's really good for newcomers to Warhammer and like Warhammer animations, Warhammer media, to actually see this because it presents a pretty interesting story. There's loads of action. It's actually really interesting to watch. One of the things that really lets it down though is the sound design is just really, really weak. Whenever things are having fights, especially close combat stuff, all of the sounds are really thin and weedy sounding, like people sword fighting sounds like people banging spoons together. <laughs> and the bolters just sound like a normal pistol, you know? They're really, really underpowered sounding. They're supposed to be massive rocket-powered, you know, slug-firing missile launchers in your hand, but they just sound like little cap guns. Slug-firing? Yeah. 
Plus all that armor sounds like tiny little robot machines. I think there's just like a drill in the sound effects office. Like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's nice to see Geordie LaForge has a job 38,000 years in the future. Whoa, whoa. Do you know what I mean? It's all, it's that movement. <laughs> Ooh, explosion. <laughs> this like really big dramatic ending boss fight essentially is so let down by the fact that the sound design is really, really weak and the music is just not even there. It's like Hartman just went out for a coffee and forgot about it. I don't know if this is a rendering issue or just a quality control issue, but the last third of the full cut thing just looks really washed out, like the contrast has just been absolutely knocked back. Everything's just really grey and washed out looking, which is a shame when your palette is only black and white and red, you know? Oh, rip James Blunt. I never thought I'd actually get personally really emotionally invested and saddened by a dreadnought dying, but here I am. Technical issues aside, that was great. That was really, really good. It was enjoyable. I think it was a great introduction to Warhammer animations for newcomers to the hobby. I'm going to give that a solid B, maybe an A. Yeah, I've landed on B. Pretty solid. It's a good story, at least. Yeah. Plus, for someone who doesn't know everything about Warhammer, it's accessible and I could watch it, you know? Yeah. The thing that was running through my mind was how cool it would be if this was recut slightly, maybe trimmed down a little bit, better music added, better sound effects added, contrast issues sorted out, and just put out as a standalone Warhammer film on like Netflix or Amazon Prime or something. It would get a huge number of new people interested in the Warhammer franchise. Also, just a quick mention on the Origins extra videos. These are really, really well animated, especially the facial animation and the, you know, the lip syncing. So hopefully that's pretty good news for any future animations that come out of this studio. Now it's time for Iron Within. Iron Within is an action-packed 3D animated short film wherein the beleaguered and desperate Imperial Guard call for Space Marine assistance to defend against the Dark Eldar and get more than they bargained for. Yeah, this looks great. Again, looks really, really nice. Really high quality animation. Beautifully rendered, really nice colors. Mm, again, with that shaky cam, man, it's everywhere. <laughs> So annoying. <laughs> Don't want to be feeling seasick when I'm watching a show. Now you might think I'm being a bit picky, but I think one of the reasons why the facial animations look a bit wrong is no one ever blinks. <laughs> it just looks really, really like alien, like uncanny valley kind of territory. Maybe that's one of the reasons why it looks a bit weird. I think the lip syncing is a bit better in this one than in Angels of Death. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Have they actually got moving tongues this time? Oh my god. <laughs> Expressions. What? There are some really beautiful shots in this show. Yeah, it's really artistically done actually, like absolutely gorgeously shot. I like this spooky dark elf man. It's like scary Legolas. <laughs> Story-wise, it's only about half an hour long. It's really intense action and quite a driving story. It's quite thrilling. It's quite interesting to watch. Uh, I would really recommend it, to be honest. It's great so far. The music is also really, really good. It's quite engaging. It really suits everything. Uh, you can kind of like really feel the vibes of all of the different characters and all of the different factions. I feel like the sound effects are also a lot better in this show. Yeah, yeah. Like it sounds like it could be real big chunky armor and not just like a little tiny robot going me, me. It's interesting and there's a little twist at the end. What more can you ask for? I want to give that, I don't know, like an A? Maybe? Maybe an A? Maybe a B? A B. Let's say a B. Good. Well done. Sure, yeah. I think I'd sit somewhere between A and B. Maybe B? B. Sure. B. B. Now it's time for an animation which many of you will already know and love but can't watch anymore because it's now paywalled on Warhammer Plus. Astartes. Astartes, if you will. <laughs> Astartes is a brief but explosive 3D animated vignette following a Space Marine strike force as they breach a heretical vessel, wade through their enemies, and uncover terrifying unknown technology. I've actually not seen this before, but I've heard loads about it, so. I've not seen it before. I've not seen it before. No. Oh, there's some actual context at the beginning. It's new. <laughs> Look at that, straight away, visual storytelling, you can see the Space Marines are absolutely enormous next to normal people. It's giving off Star Wars vibes in, like, a really good way. Yeah, regimented, weird, culty, religious space warriors. Yeah, you get that straight away. This is absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, it looks amazing. Everything still looks amazing. It's just one big action sequence, essentially, but it's just so gripping, thrilling to watch. It's mm. just really exciting. It's great. 
I think one of the best things about Astartes is it really shows you that Warhammer 40k isn't just like big men and monsters fighting each other in space. There's some weird like arcane mysterious stuff going on and that you're not really supposed to fully understand it and that's okay it's part of the fun like the big magnetic blob like the big ball demon i mean that's just magnificent it's absolutely stunning uh no doubt in my mind that is s tier oh yeah absolutely gorgeous <laughs> yeah. total s tier i feel like it looks very slightly different to how it looked on youtube i don't know if the colors have changed or something but it looks a little bit different i know some of the music had to be changed because the original one on youtube had music from the dread film in it and obviously they can't be having that in a warhammer thing so uh, i think it got replaced by some generico warhammer music but still absolutely amazing 10 out of 10 would recommend awesome yeah gorgeous okay time for hammer and bolter Hammer and Bolter is a collection of 2D animated shorts, covering standalone stories and quick adventures in both the worlds of Warhammer 40k and Age of Sigmar. Now this is your Warhammer. I kind of feel like I'm coming in like halfway through a show and I don't really know what's going on. Again, it kind of falls into the category of things that it kind of assumes you know quite a lot about already for anything to make sense when you're watching it. I mean, I really like the concept personally, and I don't really have a problem with the kind of 80s, 90s, noughties anime that was all kind of OVAs, 30 minute episodes, and you know, kind of corner cutting animation, as long as the story was good. And some of these stories are good, others, not quite so much. <laughs> Episode three, is amazing. That is brilliant. But oh, that's yeah. been there since the opening days of Warhammer Plus, right? I remember watching that in my first review. Yeah, despite the fact that it's full of orc speak, which makes me cringe. <laughs> Episode 5, A Question of Faith, is a real good fun watch and there's like a, you know, good bit of emotion at the end of it, which is nice. I also really liked episode six in the Garden of Ghosts. I thought that was really nice. It was very like emotional at the end as well. Kind of got me. Not really to my taste, to be honest, but... <laughs> it's just dunking on all the things <laughs> I like. Although it is quite nice to see Ultramarines not being portrayed as like golden wonder boys. Yeah, I mean, they're kind of the baddies in this and they mm -hmm. get cut up a lot. Given that these episodes are like between sometimes 12 and like 25, 30 minutes long, the pacing of them all seems a little bit off. They all seem very slow and quite ponderous. Apart from episode three, the Gazgol episode, that was like action-packed the whole way through and really entertaining. Uh, that's easily the highlight for me. There are some hits, there are some misses. The voice acting cast gets reused a lot. And again, that reminds me of the kind of 90s dubbing anime scene where about 10 voice actors just kept appearing over and over and over again and you'd get to know their voices inside and out. Yeah, some of these episodes are just not it. No, episode four, what's the story? <laughs> there isn't a story. <laughs> <laughs> Why are these space marines sitting around playing Underworlds in their power armor? <laughs> Again, I kind of feel like a lot of these are inaccessible. Yeah, I mean, in things this short, you don't really have time to tell everything. But then again, Astartes did. Background art is absolutely beautiful most of the time. Sometimes the actual characters and things moving look a little bit out of place, which, you know, happens in cartoons. The sound effects are really, really good though. Very big, very impressive, very imposing sounds. The music is fine, it's, it's there. Nothing is really standing out as super impressive, but you know, it certainly doesn't take away from the experience. All in all, after having watched every episode, I'm feeling this is as C as you can get. Oh yeah. Sometimes great, sometimes really not so great. But overall, it's fine, it's kind of average. And, you know, it tells lots of stories. It's doing a difficult job. I enjoyed it, but yeah, a C. I think that's fair. Yeah, on the whole, it's fine. C. Next up, we are looking at Black Talon, the first Age of Sigmar animation outside of the shorts in Hammer and Bolter. Black Talon is a 2D animated series set in the Age of Sigmar universe, following a troop of Stormcast Eternals battling against various arcane horrors, but also their own memories. Okay, so it's got the same cartoony feel as Hammer and Bolter, but it's much more nicely animated. Kind of feel like Storyforge aren't interested in bringing us into their stories. No. I don't know what's going on. No, I've got no idea. I'm, I'm a Warhammer 40k person. I don't really have much of a clue when it comes to Age of Sigmar. I mean, I'm a fantasy person on the whole, but none of these stories make sense. You. Yeah. Episode one, the story is just so obtuse and dull. I'm now kind of dreading sitting through another five episodes of this. They spent so much time just talking in that one room. 
to its credit, the sound effects are really, really good. The sound design is great. Well done to whoever did that. I don't know who you are because there's no credits <laughs> yet again. I kind of feel like with the way these characters are talking, they've done that thing like in Friends when Joey went through a thesaurus and just changed <laughs> every single word <laughs> until it made no sense. <laughs> the script is uh, interesting. Now, a lot of the voice casting in this is really good. There's some really good, cool-sounding characters, but unfortunately, Neve Black Talon, the main character of Black Talon, doesn't sound like the Celtic warrior goddess who you'd assume she was from that name. She sounds like a recruitment consultant from <laughs> Scunthorpe. For me, just really missed the mark. One of the things that just doesn't draw me in at all is that the Stormcast for like the first three, four episodes never seem to be in any danger at all. They're never at risk. They just absolutely dominate all fights and there's, there's just nothing to get excited or thrilled about. So just to reiterate, this is the first Age of Sigmar only animation in more than two years of Warhammer Plus being a thing. Just bear that in mind. Every single video has a one minute introduction and a two minute outro. Bearing in mind there are only 20 minute videos that I think are taking the piss a little bit. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, I can hear a bell. You know who's coming. It's my stinky boy. Yeah, stinky boy. <laughs> oh, there he is. My stinky man. <laughs> Okay, so the story picks up a little bit in episode four and five, and you actually start caring about some of the characters, which is, you know, novel. <laughs> but man, it ends in a really terrible way. I just assumed there was another episode and there isn't, and mm. it's just a totally pointless show. Again, I've got no interest in ever watching this again. No attachment to anyone at all. I didn't enjoy that. I feel like they've put so many effects on the voices, I can't even understand what they're saying anymore. Yeah, yeah. We've literally had to watch with subtitles to understand what they're yeah, saying. Yeah, we turned the subtitles on for this one. I feel like it's a little bit of a missed opportunity for the music. It feels very generic fantasy score, not really anything special and it's very forgettable. It looks good. It looks really nice. It's nice to see things in the Age of Sigmar setting moving around and see how things fight. For me, the story was just so atrociously dull. I can't give it anything more than a D, to be honest. Yeah, I kind of feel the same. I mean, it's nice to see skeletons and vampires and my chunky lad, <laughs> but in terms of an interesting story arc, I just don't think it has it and it didn't really draw me in at any point. So I think I'd agree with a D. Now it's time to review the final animation on Warhammer Plus, and that is Pariah Nexus. Pariah Nexus is a one-hour film split into three parts, following the remnants of an Imperial force on the war-torn world of Paradise, evading the zombie population, and a Necron assassin. This is visually stunning. It kind of reminds me of Exodite in terms of the animation quality, but everything just looks great and the lip syncing seems on it's like it's really good it looks kind of realistic it's really cool to see the necrons actually doing stuff as well and being in a thing they're only in like one or two episodes of hammer and bolter so it's nice to see them get some time to shine you know what this is a continuation of the ninth was it the ninth edition warhammer trailer with the ultramarine and the sisters of battle and the imperial guard fighting the necrons to launch indomitus yeah it's like a continuation of that that's awesome I'm sure about this chaptering system though why yeah. is there a chapter every two minutes? <laughs> what do they mean? The chaptering feels a little bit time wasty, like it's trying mm. to add out the episode by a couple of minutes that you know to make it feel like it's longer than it is. It's really, really immersive. Like the pacing is great, the sound effects are really, really good, the music is great, it really fits what's going on. It's like it feels like it's been made specifically for this and it works really well. I like it, it's coherent. Yeah, it's a story and it's interesting to watch. And it keeps you going, it keeps you engaged. Like, we've absolutely raced through these episodes and we're still watching and it's interesting and we're having fun. Mm. Interestingly, the main character, Danica, the sister of Battle, is bonkers. She's like an absolute psycho, which is fun. So after the first couple of episodes, we've tallied up the kind of blank space and the chapters and the intros and the outros. And basically out of an 18 minute video, there's three minutes of intros, outros, and like chapter intermissions. So it's really three 15 minute episodes. So it's a 45 minute show. I mean, it may not be the longest thing on here, but it's stunning. I think it's second only to Astartes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. 
Now, I don't want to give too much away because the story is quite short, but you see a lot of vulnerability with everyone here and it's it's quite interesting and engaging because of that no one is immortal or impervious or impossible to defeat you know it's really really intense and you don't know what's going to happen for the whole thing it's quite interesting also nice little psychological twist going on in here don't want to give it away but it's quite a good one all in all it was maybe a little bit short but only because we wanted there to be more it was stunning. It sounded great, looked great, music was great, the voice acting was great. Really hard to fault. The action was really interesting. No shaky cam. I mean, in my notes, I wrote A, but actually, looking back at this, I think it's maybe an S. It's really, really good. I enjoyed it the second time, and I would definitely recommend it to everyone. It's great. Yeah, I think it's absolutely gorgeous. It's really well told. It's a coherent story. It's got some interesting character arcs and I feel like I don't need to be a total expert in everything Warhammer to watch it, which is ideal, really. Mm. So I think, yeah, probably an S. And now we're out of animations, I think we're going to move on to the live action things, which is where I start to get a little bit nervous because I think I worked on almost every live action show on Warhammer Plus. But we're going to save Masterclass to last, right? Okay, let's start with Lore Masters. As the name would suggest, Lore Masters is a Warhammer lore show, covering the backstory of different characters and settings across nearly every Warhammer game franchise. So if you're familiar with YouTube lore videos and channels like Arbiterian, Luton, Voldemort, those kind of people, uh, you're going to feel right at home here. You've basically got a nicely narrated bit of lore about Warhammer, Age of Sigmar, Necromunda, there's a really good variety there accompanied by slideshows, you know, very tastefully kind of rendered slideshows of official Games Workshop art, which is a nice touch. And it's something that a lot of independent creators like myself and other people on YouTube don't have access to. We don't have access to those like really high res uh, images that they do. So it's nice to see them kind of moving around and you get to see details that you don't otherwise. I think it's entered a different era now because it used to be Wade presenting the videos and now it's this new chat called Alex. Mm -hmm. Both are very good, both have their own distinct styles, and I think they're both really good presenters. Wade seemed a little bit more like the the Warhammer everyman, if you know what I mean, like a sort of casual enjoyer who was telling you about stuff he was passionate about in terms of his delivery. Alex feels much more official, if you know what I mean, like much more Warhammery, if that makes sense. <laughs> I am noticing that the audio can be a little bit all over the shop in terms of volume, though. Yeah, I was going to say that. Between episodes, we're having to adjust volumes all the time. Some episodes are really quite quiet, and then other episodes absolutely blow you away. I think this is definitely one of the most consistent shows on Warhammer Plus. There is more than 60 episodes, so that's a pretty decent amount of material to work through. And each episode is like between 20 and 40 minutes long, so I'm quite impressed. If you've watched law videos on YouTube though, and you think, I definitely want the official source on this, so I'm gonna to subscribe to Warhammer Plus to get it, you basically are only getting the official stories, where YouTube law videos tend to be full of conjecture and speculation and interpretation. There's, there's kind of none of that in these videos, you're basically just getting the facts, which maybe you could learn from just reading a few books, but, you know, saves you the time. You can watch these while painting or doing other things. So I think they're still, they still have their place, definitely. So after having personally spent quite a long time going through all of the episodes, uh, the one thing that sticks out to me that really doesn't work is the theme music. I don't know why they chose it. It just is really, I feel like it's really ill-suited to this kind of video. It's thematically jarring. Some of that might have been the music that I chose. <laughs> so it's your fault. <laughs> You're fired. <laughs> They're lore videos. They do exactly what you expect them to do. They do it with style. They do it with really nice visuals. It's hard to not rank it a B because, to be fair, if you want this kind of thing, it absolutely delivers. It's not spectacular to kind of warrant an A or an S, but... I think a B is very, very fair for a good show. I think they're really consistent in terms of theming and production quality. They're all really good. And it's nice to see that the release schedule has been really consistent too. Yeah, sure, B. B. Sure. Speaking of the chatty shows, we're going to do the podcast style Deep Strike next. Deep Strike is a podcast style talk show that sees Games Workshop staff chatting about recent releases on Warhammer+. Plus. Oh, it's Peach. Seems weird to see him on here. <laughs> 
So basically format wise, you've got three friends and colleagues essentially sitting around a table chatting about the favorite stuff they've seen on Warhammer Plus recently, which it might seem like a strange thing to have, but actually it fulfills quite a nice little niche, which is maybe if you're in a kind of hobby situation where you don't have tons of friends who you can talk about Warhammer with, it's quite nice to hear people's opinions and like friendly chat just about stuff that you've also watched. It's quite a nice thing, I think. And they're obviously having loads of fun. They're just chatting about stuff they love, chatting about episodes they've watched. It's quite cute in a way. They're the real bricks. No. Ah, oh, is it wallpaper? No. What? It was made. How? By a company who makes like... Fake. Theatre. Oh, it's like fakey 3D bricks. Yeah, it's okay. a room inside a room. Oh. Yeah, I mean, for a podcast show, it's really nicely filmed. <laughs> it's like the nicest film podcast show you could ask for. One little criticism, though, is that for a podcast show, the audio is like all over the shop. Some people are way louder than others, and some episodes are way quieter than others. So it takes a bit of getting used to and maybe a bit of riding the volume knob. That knob. It also seems a bit um, sticky. A little bit of post-production, removing the kind of crispy mouth sounds would have been quite nice. Okay, so now having gone through these, we can see that they kind of ended the run pretty quick. There's only four episodes total and none have been released in 2023, so I assume this has been abandoned, which is a bit of a shame because it's quite a nice little format and it's a fun extra. I don't imagine it takes a huge amount of resources to create. Maybe they've got bigger fish to fry. I personally preferred the Voxcast series that they ran on YouTube. With it. I think it's ended now, they're not putting out any new episodes. Well, I think Wade's maybe a manager now, so I'm not sure if he has time to present videos anymore. That's a shame no one's stepped in to fill that role because he did a great job with those shows. So, you know, I think there's there's definitely a gap there. It's fine. It does what it says it's going to do. It's not going to blow you away, but it's a nice thing to have on in the background. So Peachy's in it. And also Peachy's in it, so it gets mega extra points. <laughs> so I'm going to give it a C. Yeah, a C's fair. Not spectacular. Does what you expect. Absolutely fine. Now for the penultimate show, Battle Report. Battle Report is a regularly updated series of concise, bite-sized battle reports between Games Workshop staff, with a good mix of core games and specialist games. I mean, it's shot wonderfully. Yeah. I've yeah. always thought that. <laughs> Next level cinematography for Battle Reports, even considering everyone online who does it professionally essentially these are astoundingly well shot and edited really really good and all those lovely um visual effects over the top were made by patrick of the painting phase oh fun fact so these are by and large really really tightly formatted tightly edited battle reports that last between 25 minutes sometimes up to about an hour but they are really really engaging watches very fluid very fun to watch. They don't focus a huge amount on the kind of detail of what is going on and the granularity of the roles. It's more a kind of fleeting overview of what each player is doing and, and why they're doing it, which is nice. It's it's a format that a lot of people will enjoy. Oh, it's Ben. He's an angel. <laughs> he's so wonderful. And he's such a good presenter. Honestly, he's made for presenting and mm. Simon's real good too. Yeah. Each video has a little bit of lore and like scene setting at the start just to kind of place you in actually what's going on, which is a really nice touch. I think a lot of people just, you know, go, we're going to play a game today, it's this army and this army, let's go, which isn't very engaging. I would say the editing is absolutely top notch. And as someone who's edited dozens of battle reports to make things that are three or four hours long condensed into half an hour, I know the struggle. I know how long that takes. So whoever did it, well done. You did an amazing job. I see they finally got some new music. <laughs> <laughs> you mean the music you didn't choose? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the one slightly annoying thing I would say is though that when rules pop up, which is a nice touch, uh, there's this kind of whoop noise and it happens so often it, it feels like someone's phone is going off, which <laughs> kind of is annoying, but you can kind of tune that out once you get used to it. But you know, it's quite jarring sometimes. At the time of recording, there are a lot of battle reports. There's almost 80. There's 35 for 40k, there's 22 for Age of Sigmar, there's 1 for Curse City, 9 for Kill Team, 3 for Underworlds, 5 for Warcry, 2 for Middle Earth, and 2 for the Horus Heresy. So a good mix of specialist games and the kind of mainstays. And it's nice because every different type of battle report has its own theming. Yeah, yeah, and like visual identity and 
yeah, templates they've obviously used. It's really nice. Mm. I feel like some of the episodes feel like they're more about the players than about the game. There's a lot of chatting and cameras facing the players, which is a bit awkward. That's not really what I want. That's not what I do in my battle reports anyway. I know some people might love that, but for example, in the video where I played the noted YouTuber Simon Clark and his amazing Orc army, I think there's only about 15 or 20 seconds of us actually playing the game in the whole video. The rest was just focused on the game and the cool minis and actually what was going on. Now I'd say, probably having looked at most of these, that about half the on-screen time is actually on the players themselves and not the tabletop, which is, for me, not really the right balance. So Battle Report, I think, is great. It kind of exceeds expectations if you're just expecting kind of plain, normal Battle Reports. They really go all out on the cinematography and the editing. Really engaging to watch. It has its negative sides, but, you know, nothing you can't put up with. So I think it's pretty good, really. It is really beautifully shot, really well edited, and I'm sure if you enjoy the games, then it's really good to watch. However, I have my biases. <laughs> now, I used to work there. I worked very closely with the Battle Report team. And one of the main people on the production crew, Nerms, is one of my favorite people ever. I think he's wonderful. And I think what he does in work is absolutely gorgeous every single time. And he's very thorough and just very good at what he does. But, uh, there's someone else on the production team who made my life a living hell for a couple of years there. So I think I'm actually going to bow out from rating this one. <laughs> well, I'm going to give it a B. <laughs> and now it's time for the final show on Warhammer Plus, and that is Masterclass. My show. Get ready for all the emotions. Yes. <laughs> Masterclass is a painting tutorial series in the classic style, where skilled Games Workshop painters show you how to create expert level painting techniques in easy to follow steps. I mean, I don't want to jump in with my opinions first because it's your show, Hattie, but looking chronologically and starting at the start, the first episodes, the ones that I originally saw, are really nicely shot, really beautifully edited. The colours on them are really gorgeous. It's legitimately the reason I, when you said you were quitting Games Workshop, I was like, do you need a job? Because these look better than my videos. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm very proud of what I achieved. Yeah, you should be. They look awesome. So just for backstory, if you don't actually know, um, I used to work at Games Workshop. I worked on Masterclass. In fact, I was at one point the only staff member on it. I was tasked with building the show from nothing to a real life show. And then we brought on Louise and then we brought on Aiden because I had creative control essentially. Uh, I was just told to go away and make a show. And I'm really proud of what I achieved, and I'm really proud of the team. I think we built something really good. And I think Louise was absolutely magnificent at her job, and Aiden was so good, and we worked so hard together, not to my own horn, but I think what we made was really good. <laughs> So we've recapped on the old episodes that you were involved in. Now we're going to uh, jump forward to now, essentially, the most recent stuff they put out and see what's going on. They seem to have implemented some things that I wouldn't do. <laughs> I mean, that's going to happen when you change the, the stuff. You know, sure. nothing's, nothing's going to continue on exactly as it was. It's still got the same themes. It's still got the same look about it. Some of the shots look a little bit washed out, like blown out. The contrast isn't there or it, the, it's like shots slightly too light. Mm -hmm. I used to spend a lot of time color correcting my footage. Yeah. And like, since you joined Midwinter Minis, you spend a lot of time doing that. I never yeah. used to color correct or, you know, like level adjust my videos. Bearing in mind I'm colorblind, that was a kind of dangerous thing to do. A lot of my videos, a lot of my early videos look a little bit strange. They were uh, very green. Yeah, but now they look <laughs> lovely. I don't know if you've noticed. Please notice. <laughs> They've got some thumbnails that are just not pictures of the mini at all. Yeah. Which is strange. Yeah, like teasers rather than mm. just showing you what you can achieve. They also seem to just not be uploading regularly anymore. Yeah, we noticed that. So just looking through my notes here, we got 62 total episodes. We counted 16 that you were directly involved in and then a couple extra that you'd shot but Maybe you didn't more. edit. And then we've only got nine for the whole of 2023. So that's basically one a month, which the upload schedule is just absolutely gone for this show, which is a bit of a shame because it used to be really regular. Yeah, I had to be constantly on the go. I think that it was like one a week. Yeah, well, that's one of the reasons why you got really stressed out, right? Yeah. 
And we've also now had a third presenter on the show. It obviously started with Louise. Aiden was introduced. Aiden was, was he a member of the heavy metal painter yep. team? Yeah, so he's like an incredibly good painter, yeah. like one of the world's top painters, showing you how to paint, which is incredible. Louise had her own very distinct style, but she was an amazing painter, mm -hmm. which she has shown in her own channel now. But this third presenter is unfortunately nameless. We don't know who they are. Yeah. Um, whoever you are, you're doing a great job. Well done. I do feel, though, that it's maybe lost the masterclass element. The new episodes seem to be fine. I would say on par with some of the kind of better YouTube painting tutorials, which isn't necessarily what you want from a show that's called Masterclass. I would expect you to be shown how to paint quite advanced techniques from the world's best painters. And this guy's great, but, you know, I can't see anything that has been painted in the show so far, like winning any awards or anything like that. It's kind of like really, really nicely painted. But if you saw it in a display cabinet, you'd be like, that's nice. What's the next one? Do you know what I mean? It might sound really harsh, but it's not quite the level of painting that I'd expect. This new presenter feels very presentery mm. and not so much like a painting teacher. That's fair. I feel like when it shows you the paintless as well, in your episodes, they're all kind of in some sort of order of like layers and bases and, and like grouped together in colors. But now they're just like, bam, here you go. Here's all the colors you need and no order. Yeah, I used to categorize those boys and then alphabetize within my categories. Some of the more recent videos are really good, like the Dragon Scales one, that looks great. But others just look a little bit weird, like the exclusive Warhammer Plus Vampire mini just looks really average. Well, we didn't used to be allowed to paint full miniatures. No, it was a particular was, thing, wasn't it? Like a, a technique. Yeah. a small section or a technique that you would teach people. Because mm. there's so much information you can fit into just painting black. Yeah, I think people, if they're wanting to paint to a really expert level, they appreciate the granularity of explaining in very, very small detail and very precise detail what you're doing, Yeah, which you can't really do if you're painting a whole miniature in like a 12 minute video. Yeah. From experience, I can't. I kind of gloss over some things and assume a little bit of knowledge. Plus painting full miniatures is what we would do on the YouTube channel when mm. I worked on that. Yeah. So it just feels like they're sort of covering the same ground. Blending the two together. Yeah. Oh, look at those messy paint lists. <laughs> I like how they alphabetize the paint list, but they don't alphabetize the rules in the rule book. <laughs> I feel like it's a little bit of a shame to see Masterclass go in this direction. What I would have really, really liked to see, and what I think would have been the absolute best outcome for Masterclass, is if Darren Latham got involved because he is an excellent painter. He is well regarded in the community. He's well known to the Warhammer community as an excellent painter and Games Workshop employee. And I think the popularity of his short-lived YouTube channel kind of speaks for itself in that he would have been pretty much the perfect person for this and would have done exactly what I said in explaining in very, very understandable, very easy to follow detail of a very complex, very elaborate, but artistically rewarding process that I think a lot of people would have really, really been interested in. I assume he's an incredibly busy person, but I think actually having Darren Latham presenting Masterclass would be a massive driver to people subscribing to Warhammer Plus. It's a really hard job to actually do. Absolutely. For the presenting, you need someone who is very good at explaining what they're doing, which I found with heavy metal painting is not in their nature. <laughs> Because, you know, when you know something so well and you just, it's like an innate ability, mm. how do you explain that to people? So fun fact, actually, on the Darren Latham thing, mm. I was asked to edit down his YouTube videos for Warhammer Plus at one point and make them like more Warhammer Plus-esque. Really? Yeah. So I put in all the graphics and everything and I cut them all together, but, you know, I spent a lot of time on it and then management decided after I'd done all the work that they didn't like it. <laughs> Classic. So it eventually got scrapped. No, that would have been so good. That would have been such a nice addition to the show. Time to rank it. I think, to be fair, I don't think we're in a particularly strong era of Masterclass yet. So I'm going to struggle to give it a high rank, really. I know it's not, but it feels like it's slightly abandoned. We've only had nine or ten episodes this year. Well, maybe they're actually just giving their whole team the right amount of time to make these videos. Mm. Well, in that case, maybe they need to set their expectations better with mm. their subscribers. In fairness, given the good, given the bad, I'm going to give it a C. 
it's fine now. Which is unfortunate because I think the first time I reviewed Warhammer Plus, that was my standout show. And now it's kind of middling. Bit of a shame. I have very mixed feelings <laughs> because this show was my baby. This was the first thing I had control over. I'm so proud of what we did when I was there. And I'm so proud of Louise and of Aiden for carrying on after I'd gone. And I'm proud of what they did. But now it feels different. And obviously it's going to feel different. I know that. But it's a bit bittersweet for me <laughs> watching these back. I would rate my own work. S. An S. Because <laughs> I love what we did, but uh, I'm not sure how to rate the new stuff. I mean, maybe I would rate it a B. I think it's an absolutely fine painting show, but it's called Masterclass. And really now, it's not a masterclass. It's a painting video. It's quite a generic painting tutorial series. So they either need to rename it or switch it up a bit and ramp up the quality of the paint jobs because it's not really doing it for me at the moment. Please, if any of the editors are watching, please color correct the footage. <laughs> so that's it. All 12 Warhammer Plus shows judged and ranked. You may say judged harshly, but hey, that's just our opinion. If you've seen the shows and you disagree with us, please let us know your rankings in the comments. Now we did promise not just a ranking, but a general review of Warhammer Plus now that it's matured into its third year. First, let's quickly recap a few bits and bobs and small little things you might be wondering. Can you cast Warhammer Plus to your TV? Well, yes and no. Apparently some people can using Chromecast, but I just couldn't get it to work no matter how hard I tried. I ended up using DEX on my Samsung phone to cast it to my TV. It kind of makes the TV into a little computer, which is weird, and I was able to watch it from there. When my phone started running out of battery, I switched to using my laptop connected with an HDMI cable to my TV. So not a very smooth setup, but it did the job. Also, there doesn't seem to be any smart TV app as far as I can tell, but there is a Warhammer TV service on Amazon Fire and Roku apparently, but I don't have either of those. There is also still a total lack of credits on all shows apart from the music composers. It's not standard not to credit anyone. It's also not fair. This was a problem we dealt with when I was working there and I think it's been going for a number of years and I don't think they have any intention to change. We were told that we shouldn't be so egotistical, that it's about the company and not us. But even just a whole page at the end of each episode with just a list of everyone who was involved, you know, editors, colorists, animators, whatever. That's all you need, just, just a single page. There's so, so many like weird title cards on every single thing with like random Warhammer quotes. Just credit people, it's not hard, honestly, please. <laughs> In quite a few of the shows, I experienced some technical issues with the Warhammer Plus website, specifically like the delivery, maybe the back-end infrastructure. I quite often got the little rotating buffering ring thing on pretty much everything I watched, uh, only appearing for a second or so, but it was quite distracting. There are multi-language subtitles, which is a nice touch, but there doesn't seem to be any kind of resolution or quality control on the app or on the website itself. And some of the shows seem to be a little bit low bitrate, like the edges were a little bit weird and some things didn't look quite right. The colors were a bit dark. You could see the edges of certain colors, especially in low light stuff, which kind of wasn't really what I expected. There's also some pretty wild volume discrepancies between shows and also within shows themselves. Mm. Yeah, I found I was constantly riding the volume knob, just like making things louder and making things quieter. And, and sometimes when you jump to a new episode, you just get blown away by the initial sound. And like, if you're wearing headphones, like RIP, you're dead. That's the kind of thing that I would expect to be caught by some kind of like general media manager within the Warhammer TV or Warhammer Plus team. Uh, I don't know if that kind of role exists. Did it exist when you were doing it? Not really, no. No. Someone just to kind of make sure everything is of the same kind of, not quality, but of the same audio levels and just generally making sure that the platform has a kind of uniform set of standards that it adheres to, which it kind of doesn't at the moment. I suppose the pace of the releases needs to be addressed as well. Some of the things, especially Battle Report and Lawmasters, are released on a very, very regular schedule, something that you can rely on and look forward to. Everything else, especially the animations, is really hit and miss. Like, you don't know when things are coming out. I think deadlines and promise dates have been missed several times. I don't really know why that is, and I wouldn't like to speculate. I don't have any insider knowledge, and no, you don't work there anymore. You don't really either. Mm. But 
it's you know something that you would really want to see improved if you were actually paying for this service. That being said, when you're talking about Warhammer Plus, you are not just talking about Warhammer TV, which is where all of these things are hosted. You're also talking about the free minis that you get, access to the Warhammer Vault, and of course more features in the Warhammer 40k and Age of Sigmar apps. I know a lot of people have voiced this already, but in my opinion, the quality of the included minis has kind of waned over time. The first two were really, really interesting. The second batch were great. I mean, the, the Terminator was cool, but the scale and the offering seemed a bit kind of pulled back. And now this year's are basically two infantry sized characters, neither of which really interest me at all. So that certainly for me wouldn't be a factor in deciding whether or not to join Warhammer Plus. One of the more niche benefits to Warhammer Plus is access to the Warhammer Vault. It's one of the kind of lesser spoken about things. And the Vault, by and large, is pretty good. You get access to a really good portion of the old back catalogue of White Dwarf and loads of other visual publications and promotional stuff that Games Workshop has put out over the years. And it's really enjoyable if you like that kind of thing. There are a few sections of White Dwarf that have been like removed or censored for whatever reason, but on the whole, I would say it's pretty good. However, it has to be said that the rate at which those things have been added has really slowed down in recent months. I don't know why that is, but you know, it's something to bear in mind. Also, the final point I want to address is that the Warhammer Plus landing page is just really confusing. Like, I don't understand why even when I'm logged in and it knows I'm a Warhammer Plus subscriber, why isn't it just a landing page where it shows me Warhammer TV, Warhammer Vault, and you know, maybe shortcuts to the apps or something like that. You need to actually go to the separate websites, Warhammer TV, Warhammer Vault, or the apps to actually experience those parts of the offering, which is confusing, not just from a business perspective, but from like a customer facing perspective. I think they need to be considerate of that. And also the Warhammer TV website itself is really awkward to use, especially if you're used to the kind of very sleek interface of things like Netflix. It just, it goes all over the shop. You have to keep pressing the back button to get out of things. It's just, it's quite a confusing, strange experience. If you click on a thumbnail and you think you're gonna watch the episode, no, you have to scroll down on the left-hand side and hit mm. the play button. It's, it's just really awkwardly laid out. I think they need to up their UI game, to be honest. It gets more annoying the more you use it as well. Yeah, definitely. There's been a few occasions as well where we've jumped to a different episode of something and it's just randomly started playing something totally different. Like mm. we wanted to check out the next episode of Hammer and Bolter, we went to the next one and it started playing Angels of Death. Warhammer Plus is $5.99 a month or £50 a year. And we watched literally everything they had in one week preparing this video. So if you're the kind of person who just wants to binge watch the shows they want to watch in one week, then a one month subscription is going to be fine for you. Seems like a lot of money for not a lot on Warhammer TV, but you also get vault access and rules and army builder access in the 40k app and the AOS app, at least for all armies that don't have their latest codex or battle tome released, and an exclusive mini. If there was a YouTube channel that put out almost 100 videos a year, a mix of painting tutorials, battle reports, lore videos, long form chat shows, and original animations, some great, some not so great, but most of them absolutely fine, I think you'd be pretty inclined to support them in their endeavors. Maybe chuck a fiver a month their way on Patreon or something. That's literally how this channel survives and how we can continue to make videos that are free to view for everyone. The thing is, I know a lot of people who support our channel because they like the feeling of not only supporting what we do, making the videos we make, but also kind of altruistically supporting the wider hobby because we make all of our videos free to watch on YouTube so everyone can enjoy what we do. The Warhammer TV stuff is paywalled. And not only that, as part of the Warhammer Plus launch, loads of fan-made animations were purged from YouTube, which was a big blow for the community. Basically, I think we can see that a lot of people would enjoy Warhammer Plus and see the benefit in not just subscribing for a month or two to binge all the shows and drop out again, but rather staying on, getting the exclusive free mini and full access to the army builder and the apps. I'm definitely one of those people, but to be fair, I'm a full-time content creator who makes things mostly related to Games Workshop's games. So I think it would honestly be a pretty stupid business decision to drop my membership. But I have to say, honestly, if I was just a casual Warhammer enjoyer, I would have cancelled my membership this year. Now we both know that there are incredibly talented, hardworking and passionate people behind these shows. Not that any of them are credited, of course. So we don't want this to come across as a slight at them, but Games Workshop is a business, and it was the business's choice to make things this way. 
removing the fan animations on YouTube, dictating an intense release schedule which led to overworking, understaffing and extreme stress and pressure on the staff, which has obviously led to some of us leaving. And that's without even mentioning the issues people have with the 40k app. So fair is fair, Warhammer Plus does have loads of stuff to offer. Some of it is great, a lot of it is okay, some of it's not so great. But I think we both agree, and hopefully you do as well, that there is still a lot of room for improvement. Six out of ten. <laughs> oh, I didn't realise we were ranking the whole service. Yeah, there. the whole thing. Okay. Warhammer <laughs> Plus, six out of ten. Cool. I have some incredibly good memories from working on Warhammer Plus, and I have some less than good memories, but it is what it is. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please drop a comment down below, hit the like button, maybe share it with a friend who is thinking about joining Warhammer Plus. Thank you so much to Incogni for sponsoring this video, giving us a little safety net for when this video gets inevitably demonetized, and we'll catch you next time. Bye for now. Bye bye.